So scientists and patients have for decades tried to understand why the same medication at the same dose works well for some people and not for others, or why some people need higher or lower doses than others, or why some people have side effects and others do not. Patients themselves have long known which products work best for them. And the desire to understand and use the underpinnings of these observations for the benefit of all patients has led to the field of pharmacogenomics and precision medicine. Think about it. Most treatments are designed for the average person and the median response rate or the median survival rates. Those are what are used to assess efficacy of drugs and support FDA approval. But by using a median response rate to declare efficacy, we know that many patients are not benefited by therapy. Humans are all different, and what may be best for one individual may not be best for another. And therefore, this should not be a surprise to us. One size does not fit all. Think about it. If you need a pair of glasses, you aren't assigned a generic a pair that works for the average individual. You get a prescription customized for you. If you need a blood transfusion, there is, it has to match your blood type. We are now entering an era where we are matching drugs to individual genes, whether it be heritable germline genetics or somatic mutations in the case of cancers. So imagine a day when a, when a, a patient receives from the pharmacy a tablet or a capsule with their name imprinted on the side, which contains the right drug and the right dose. While this might seem far-fetched right now, we have only just begun to appreciate the power and the implications of precision medicine. So the field of precision medicine has moved forward in a dramatic way last year when President Obama came behind and supported the Precision Medicine Initiative. The Precision Medicine Initiative made precision medicine an immediate national priority. $130 million was allocated to the NIH to build a large-scale research participant group called the Million Person Cohort. $70 million was allocated to the National Cancer Institute, and nearly $500 million will de be designated in the next year. Oncology was a natural choice as the initial focus for this very initi ambitious initiative, given that the cancers are diseases of the genome. In 2016, Eric Dishman was made the director of the Precision Medicine Cohort Program and will lead the NIH's efforts to build this landmark longitudinal research study. You will hear today from Dr. McCarty about the Emerge Consortium and Essentia Health participation in enrolling subjects into large precision medicine consortia to, to identify predictors of disease and response. There was an interesting analysis published last year, last year um, in Nature. These investigators evaluated the top 10 grossing approved drugs in the United States. And they found that when they looked back through the literature, that in fact the majority of patients did not, um, did not, did not have what they would consider a, uh, a good response to medications. In this picture, these are the first one is Abilify. Most of these are all drugs that you've heard on television being av advertised. But in terms of Abilify, the, re the red people um, indicate patients who have not gotten an optimal response. The blue people are patients who have gotten a good response. And you can see in the case of Abilify, only one out of five individuals are considered to have had a, an adequate or good response to Abilify. And anyway, the, that was, was true for all the top 10 grossing drugs in the United States. Evidence such as this supports the importance of um, precision medicine and our need to improve drug therapies. Just as we saw in the Nature Report, it is well known that medications do not improve the health of all people, despite a global pharmaceutical market of around $3 billion. For many diseases, the use of drugs is like shooting blind food. We hope that we use enough pills and shoot fast enough that disease will be controlled. However, we all know this is not a good method for treatment of disease. Let's just take the simple example and well-known example in pharmacogenomics. If there are 300 people at this conference, 30 will be CYP2D6 poor metabolizers. These individuals, will, if they require codeine, will poorly convert it to the active component morphine, and they will not, they will not achieve good pain control. They also may have problems with drugs like tramadol, oxycodone, hydrocodone. These individuals should get morphine or non-opioid analgesic as first-line therapy. But yet, we do not routinely um, test genetics for codeine therapy. 
There's also been a flood of personalized medicines within the novel new drugs category that have been approved over the last two years. In 2014, the FDA uh, approved 41 novel new drugs, 20, uh, uh, of which nine were classified as uh, personalized medicines. In, in 2015, 45 novel new drugs were approved. 28% were per, are classified as personalized medicines. Of the personalized medicines in 2015, one-third were oncology. Uh, agents. Therapeutic areas, other therapeutic areas active in personalized medicines are cardiovascular disease, asthma, hep C, and psychiatry. You'll hear more about the role of the FDA today in pharmacogenomics from Dr. Pakanowski. It's not just the new drugs where pharmacogenomic discoveries are being made and utilized. Work has been done over the past 10 to 15 years to identify genetic markers for some of the older agents. Approximately 7% of FDA-approved drugs um, um, are, are influenced by actionable um, pharmacogenomic markers, um, and 18% of, an, es of an, uh, an estimated 4 billion outpa outpatient prescription business that are filled every year in the United States are affected by actionable pharmacogenomic markers. Therefore, the potential impact of pharmacogenomics nationally is immense. These numbers will only grow because many of the older medications have yet to be studied for genetic, um, genetic markers. You'll hear today from Dr. Weitzel about clopidogrel pharmacogenomics and Dr. Mueller about drugs used in psychiatry and the number of patients that are potentially affected by pharmacogenomic variants relevant to those drugs. Some of the more significant advances in precision medicine have been made in cancer. There are several unique aspects of cancer that inform selection of therapy. Somatic mutations are important for many cancers and have powerfully driven precision medicine in the field. Molecular profiling in cancer can provide prognostic markers, efficacy markers, which will determine sense drug sensitivity and resistance, exposure predictors that predict pharmacokinetics, and toxicity predictors. As we know, germline, germline variants are inherited and do not change over time. However, somatic mutations, in the case of solid tumors, are, static, or are not static, and new mutations may develop over time in patients receiving targeted therapies. Therefore, repeated testing of, muta of these mutations may be necessary to identify changes in mutations that then would drive a therapy change. We'll hear about some of these cancer mutations today from Dr. Stewart. Recently, it was elegantly stated in a paper published in Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics that pharmacogenetics is not just for outlier individuals. Although the beginning of the field of pharmacogenomics in the 1950s was built on observations in a rare few outlier patients with very severe reactions to drugs, it is no longer applicable just to a few outlier patients. Pharmacogenomics now could matter for everyone. Many of you will be surprised today to learn of the genetic variants that you carry. And although you may not be on drugs today where these variants are relevant, you may be in the future. Therefore, these variants are not just what a few patients carry, but what we all carry. The data in this figure shows the percent of patients taking a, potentially, a potential drug with an increased risk of either a poor outcome or, or, or a toxicity. In the first plot in the yellow bars shows that at least almost nearly 100% of patients will con carry some sort of germline mutation um, that could put them at an incre possibly increased risk for a bad drug effect. <clears throat> This group also then categorized some of these drugs as high-risk drugs, and nearly, uh, and in some, almost 50% of patients will carry at least one genetic variant that could put them at very high risk to a bad drug outcome. These are the, the in the it, the red bars. Those are the kind of drugs where where it, the 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 drug therapy would be contraindicated, um, and an alternative agent should should be used. You'll hear more about many of the drugs that fall within these categories today, actionable categories from Dr. Cottle when she describes the CPIC guidelines. 
So to bring this to a li little bit closer to home, this is data from our own research group where we have ge evaluated genetic variants that were on a large GWAS chip in about 3,000 kidney transplant patients that we enrolled in our multi-center trial, of which about one-third of these patients were transplanted or actively followed at the University of Minnesota. And although we only evaluated eight genes relevant to several drugs, we <clears throat> We have found that patients, that at least one third of patients carry at least, at least two actionable variants, another third will carry, uh, carry at least um, a thir uh, 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 three actionable variants, and so on. Um, less than 1% of our patients did not have an actionable variant. So an important aspect of genetic variation is that allele frequency differs between populations. This plot shows the differences in, in, um, in frequency um, by population um, for some of the common pharmacogenetic genes. The blue bars are the Caucasian population, the red are European ancestry individuals, and the red bar are the African Americans. You can easily see that genetic variation can be much higher in one population versus another. Therefore, discussions whether to do genetic testing based on allele frequencies from a clinic that may contain primarily Caucasian patients would be the absolutely wrong decision for, uh, for African American patients. Although not shown here, there are also striking difference in allele frequencies for many of the pharmacogenetic genes between the Asian and Caucasian populations too. So implementation of pharmacogenomics is growing and many hospitals and health systems in the U.S. have been progressive and implemented preemptive pharmacogenetic testing. Some of the centers who are pioneering in, these, in the United States are, are on this slide, the Mayo Clinic, Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, University of Florida, and Vanderbilt University. Availability of clinical guidelines for pharmacogenetic interpretation of actionable variants has been critical in the adoption of pharmacogenetic testing across the U.S. The preemptive approach used by these centers makes the most economic sense given the ability to perform batch testing at a fraction of the cost that genotyping a single gene or a variant at time of drug prescription. The need for tools to capture, store, and analyze and use genomic data is immense and has brought a revolution of developing clinical decision support tools. Therefore, powerful computation platforms, interactive EMRs, decision support systems, and programs to manage and comprehend the vast amount of laboratory and clinical data, imaging data, and now genetic data are being built and designed. Every day brings better and better and more creative decisions to use. We are now also entering an era where data will be captured on smartphones or other devices and fed directly into the EMR. Therefore, effective, nimble, and creative IT support is imperative to development of the electronic health system, record system. You will hear about this today from Dr. Ella Ferris when he discusses big science and informatics. And finally, the price of genetic testing has fallen dramatically over a decade, the last decade and a half. Full genome sequencing prices are now approaching $1,000 for a full germline sequence. Imagine if this would be tested at birth and therefore available for an entire lifetime. As the cost of genetic testing comes down, the arguments and objections to using genetics to guide therapy become very difficult to support. It becomes challenging to imagine the near future healthcare scenario in which pharmacogenetic testing would not be cost effective. We'll hear today from Dr. Sean DeMeyer, who will, who will discuss with us and ask the question, who will pay for pharmacogenetic testing? In the cancer arena, with the influx of safer and more effective targeted therapies, we have moved from decades of serious organ toxicity and cytotoxic chemotherapy to an era of what's termed financial toxicity. Since 2000, there have been 32 um, orally administered anti-cancer drugs introduced to the market. The cost of one month of targeted therapy in 2014 was $11,000 with an average co-pay of $2,000. Prices of many of the targeted therapies have gone up, not down, as new indications are found for the therapies. This is not what happens in the traditional drug market. Therefore, rational and effective use of these targeted agents are imperative for the healthcare systems, but particularly for our patients and their families that pay for these drugs. The world has also gone mobile. 
and it has driven the healthcare industry in a very positive way. Imagine the day when therapeutic drug monitoring is done through a patch on the skin, or, an eye, pr or eye pressure is measured through a contact lens, tremors may be measured through a finger cap, urine output in patients on diuretics perhaps could be captured um, through sensing devices in diapers. In the future, devices will be, will be used to assess drug response at home or even diagnosis or detection of disease recurrence through handheld imaging devices. Mobility of the elderly can now be monitored in their homes to, uh, to improve their safety. These devices may be cost effective as well, and as well as improve patient convenience. These wearable sensors will feel, feed direct data directly into the electronic medical record and may be com combined with genomic information. Economists have pro projected that the global personalized precision medicine mar market will be big, and by 2022, the market they expect will be near $3 billion. $3 billion, billion, not million, with the biggest growth in personalized wellness and nutrition. There's a vast growth of body of research that supports using genetic markers and lifestyle factors to assess disease risk, which may be used to reduce risk of poor health outcomes. This will also likely include medications to reduce risk of things such as cardiovascular disease, such as preventive agents, or even cancer development. Although today's conference is about genomics, we can't focus on one type of omic in isolation of one another. There are many, many other omic tools that will move eventually into clinical practice. There's a this slide just shows some of the many omic types of um, uh, uh, platforms that we are now moving into, genomics, which we're talking today, the transcriptome, proteomics, metabolomics, the microbiome, as everybody knows, is hot now, and the epigenome is going to be quite important, the exposome. But of course, these have to be combined. It's all nice to have this genomic information, but there's also the social determinants of health that need to be understood with the, the, the omic um, uh, markers, biosense and then, of course, the area of imaging. So the, all of this is going to create a topological map of health and, health and disease. And it's going to be, it'll be complex to use. So sort of in closing, the use of medical testing of any sort goes through a number of steps to finally reach the patient all the way from discovery to policy. In pharmacogenomics, we are far down this pathway for many of the genomic markers. Many of the markers have been validated, replicated, clinical utility has been defined, and in some cases there's already pharmacogenomic meta-analysis. The number of markers that will eventually reach practice will continue to grow, and someday using a genetic marker will be akin to us using creatinine clearance or age in, th in, in drug therapy or dose selection decisions. So the vision for personalized medicine is not only the right dose of the right medication for the right patient at the right time, but also a plan for health that is personalized, predictive, preemptive, and participatory. So with that, I'm, I will now close, and I'm going to turn the stage over to some of our distinguished guests. Once again, welcome to the University of Minnesota and our inaugural Precision Pharmacogenomics Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.